in a world full of negative people. Hey man, I'm just trying to be a positive guy, a positive farmer, a positive outfitter. This is the Shark Farmer Podcast with your host, Rob Sharkey. Whatever. And welcome again to Shark Farmer Podcast. Hey, I'm your host, Rob Sharkey. And today, you know, I'm not even really sure where we're going to today. I think it's either, I think it's New Zealand, Texas, which I didn't know was a place, but we'll figure it all out. Today, we're talking with Craig Hickman from Ashburton, New Zealand, but that's not where you are. Is that correct, Craig? That's right. I'm in uh, Austin, Texas for a week. I came over um, for a wedding and last day here today and head home tomorrow. Did you get married? I did not get married. I actually uh, came over for the wedding of somebody I've never met before. I um, am here for the wedding of a friend from Twitter. I'm sorry, but that's pretty damn cool. So you you met somebody on Twitter, and you you came from New Zealand to Texas to go to their wedding. Well, it's what you do nowadays, isn't it? It's uh, it's a bit of an adventure, and uh, Lamia is she's a Kiwi, uh, marrying a Texas Texas boy. She's very popular on on New Zealand Twitter, and uh, wanted somebody there. I, I periscoped her wedding, so Twitter could be there with her. New Zealand Twitter could be at the wedding, and we had a great time. You're going to confuse right. a lot of people, first of all, because I've had the pleasure of going to your your home planet of New Zealand. Beautiful country. I mean, if I was at the Hobbiton and all that stuff like that. But you said a kiwi. Now, a kiwi, we think, is a fruit. Maybe some people is a bird. But no, no, no. Explain to us what a kiwi is. A kiwi is a, a New Zealander, and, and the fruit is a kiwi fruit. Um, you guys have it totally wrong. So whenever we say kiwi, we are talking about the person, very rarely talking about the bird. That's right. So like as we say, um, uh, she's an American, you said she's a kiwi. So we we should all have this figured out by now, right? You should. You should have it figured out. So I I arrived on on Monday and I drove from Houston to Austin on Tuesday straight to the bride's house and had lunch with her and her husband-to-be and met them both for the first time. And then went and had drinks with all of the uh, other Kiwis that had come over, but on Wednesday and then the wedding on Friday. So it's been quite the whirlwind tour. Yeah, I didn't realize people from New Zealand drank. Did you not? No. It's, uh, it's a national pastime. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you've been here in the States, right? And uh, I'm sure you've been driving around. You Hopefully you've got out in the country a little bit. Have you seen uh, our collection of grain bins? So are you a collection of? The grain bins, where we put our corn, soybeans, cotton, kiwis. <laughs> no, no, I haven't. I haven't seen much of that at all. To, to be honest, I've been terrified of the Austin traffic, and yeah. I've been Ubering everywhere. And today, yesterday was the first I got out into the country. I went and visited a, a ranch yesterday. Katie Kent kindly invited me out to their Angus stud, and that was my first drive out into the country. And uh, I'm forever gra- grateful for Katie for that. That was. Things I'd never seen before. Did she brand you? She did not. Huh. But her um, her, <laughs> her brand is K A F, and apparently it stands as uh, stands for Kent Angus Farms. But I thought it stood for something else. But then, you know, A F stands for something else entirely on Twitter. <laughs> uh, I think a brand would have been a lovely souvenir to bring back from the states. Well, I did have southern I. Tea and 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 barbecue. They uh, barbecue and Angus roast for me, so it was absolutely amazing. Okay, quit sidetracking me, Craig. I'm trying to get to my ad. Uh, let's just not even segue into it. So today's uh, advertiser is StepsGMS.com is their website. So you've got these grain bins, and see the problem is this year is a lot of people are putting a wet corn, which means the moisture is wet, into the bins, and it's going to be horrible. And even when you're drying it. You're drying it really warm, and then you put it in a bin. We all know that doesn't work very good. So you don't know what to do with your fans, right? The aeration fans that blow the air into there and keep the grain where it should be. Either you leave them on too much, and you are wasting money with electricity or drying the grain down too much, or you don't do it enough, and you end up taking a bulldozer and peeling off the side of your grain bin. I mean, that's an extreme example, Craig, but you you get the picture, right? I get the picture. What Steps GMS does is they hook your bin fan up to the interweb. They, there's satellites up in the sky. They can tell what the temperature is and the humidity is and all that stuff. 
and they know what the humidity is and all the information inside, they know when to turn on your fan. They do it automatically. Can you imagine that? You don't even have to do anything. It sounds magical. It is, yes. Or, like, say you're at, uh, let's say, a wedding in Texas, and uh, your kid calls, and he says, hey, I'm trying to have a party, and the Ben fans are blaring, but I don't know how to shut them off because I've never helped out enough for you to show me how to shut them off. You can get on your phone and shut off the Ben fan. That's pretty cool. Can you turn them up, though? Well, I mean, Ben fans are generally just one speed. I'm sure you can. I don't know. I'm going to say yes, but honestly, I don't know. But you know what? They also, you, not just Ben's, you're a, a dairy guy, right? Oh, I'm a dairy farmer, yes. You think about being in Texas and looking at your phone and saying, oh, you know what? It's like two degrees warmer than it should be, and I should turn on that one fan. And you could do it from Texas. I mean, what an amazing day that would be. It's like living in the future. It, oh, it truly is. That's why you, Craig, need to go to stepsgms.com. That's Steps gms.com i've had the guy on before eli troyer and he used to build grain bins so he knows grain bins from back in the 60s there's nobody that knows grain bins more than eli i'm just gonna say that well i'm i'm stunned i just don't know what to say you know you don't have to say anything just go to the website and buy something and tell them shark farmer sent you but anyway craig you're you're from new zealand the first thing I'm sure everybody wants to know is just who are you? What kind of guy are you? Give us some background. A background, I would say I'm not from a farming family. I um, didn't really know what I wanted to do, and uh, I knew I wanted to leave school. I talked my parents into that by saying that I, I need to leave school to go and um, earn enough money to go to university. And I just thought I might go farming. And my father said, well, if you're going to leave school for a year to earn enough money to go to university, you need to go and do a well-paying job. And he hooked me up with a job at, a, at an abattoir in, in the South Island processing sheep. At a what? So I, I what was that? The, sorry? An abba what? Uh, an abba, a sheep abattoir, a slaughterhouse. Oh, okay. A meat packer. A All right, packer, you might say. I don't speak Kiwi. I'm sorry. So I went. <laughs> so we were. I was living in the North Island at that stage, and and went to the South Island and and worked at this meat packers for a for a year, and it was great. I was 18. I was earning lots of money, and I thought I could probably just stay doing that. And my father rang me up and said, "Have you enrolled at university yet?" And I said, "Well, no, not yet. I haven't quite got round to it." So he enrolled for me. And so I had to give away my job as a meat packer and then head back up to the North Island where I, I went to Massey University for three years and did a Bachelor of Agriculture. That was very interesting being a one of the few non-farmers doing, doing an ag degree. And after three years, I'd had more than enough of it. And I went and uh, worked in advertising for five years. It had nothing to do with farming for five years after I left university, got married. And then I started having a few health issues. I, I couldn't see properly. I'd go through periods where I was losing my eyesight and it would slowly come back. And stress and staring at a computer all day wasn't helping. And my wife said to me, well, you've got this degree in agriculture. Why don't we finally use it and go farming? So we, we packed up and went to the Waikato, which is the, um, the heart of farming in New Zealand. Lots of a huge concentration of dairy farms. And we went dairy farming for the right. first time. Whoa, 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 and whoa, 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 whoa. You lost your sight? That had to be horrifying. Uh, yeah, it's very strange. It would, it would go for um, for maybe a week, and then over the period of another week it would come back. Yeah, it was absolutely terrifying and not sustainable to be sitting in front of a computer for eight hours a day and the stress of deadlines every month. So we decided to do something about it. I don't blame you a bit. Yeah, that would been. scare me to death if I lost my sight. I mean, did you know that it was coming back? Was, or was there a point where you were sitting there going, I don't know if I'll ever see again? Uh, always. You always wonder whether it's going to come back. The technical term is punctate in a choroidopathy. So it's holes in the choroid, which is behind your retina. And nobody knows what causes it. And when you have uh, stress, you get little lesions and they expand on your eye and, and you lose your sight. And as you get better, they go down. And if you're unlucky, 
they leave scars and if you have a scar you've lost that bit of your sight permanently so I've got quite a few scars on my eyes and in, out of my right eye I've got no central vision so mm. also makes driving in Texas a lot of fun yes what's uber for okay you first of all, i've got to make some of this stuff clear because you just threw a whole lot at us so you were down there you were ever twattering and your dad signed you up for college and then you so you got an ag degree you got yeah. you got married and then you had the stress of the advertising job and then your wife said go go be a dairy guy did i get that right yep that's almost exactly how it happened <laughs> um in New Zealand, uh, the dairy industry is seasonal, so we start, the, the dairy season starts on June the 1st and goes through to May the 31st, and, and that's the cycle, that's the financial year. Back then, it was everybody started their new dairy job on June the 1st, so if, if you wanted a job, you just knew that it would start on June the 1st. Mm -hmm. So we had a, had a time frame, and, and everybody advertises at the same time because everybody is looking for workers at the same time. It was relatively easy to find a job. I mean, that was 1996, and I caught up with my very first employer just a couple of weeks ago, and it was like I'd, I'd never left. The dairy industry in New Zealand is small enough that everybody knows everybody and we all, sure. all yeah. keep in touch. The other thing about the New Zealand dairy industry is that we don't tend to stay on one farm. Uh, we want to progress. If you want to uh, move up in the world, then you, you've done your time on one farm, then you find another farm that has a job at the level you want to be at, and then on June the 1st, you move on to a new farm. So so every few years, you you move and you progress and you move up the industry. So within four years, I think, I was managing a farm. I'm not sure after four years I was quite ready for it, but uh, it was a huge state of uh, expansion uh, the 90s was it mm -hmm. the dairy industry was absolutely exploding let's try to because you got a lot of americans listening and i think you probably already said some things that maybe doesn't even make sense to them this was my take when i went over there and this was 2005 we were meeting dairy farmers wow. that did not have ag backgrounds. We were meeting dairy farmers that were running farms that had started just like you did. You know, my first job was advertising, whatever. That was so foreign to the group that I was with because, you know, you, they say in, in the United States, farming is a birthright. I thought that was a huge difference between the states in New Zealand. New Zealand, I mean, the people that come and work at these farms can eventually move up to where in the state sometimes, you know, the hired man that helps on a farm or the person that's milking or running their hogs or whatever never moves up to like uh, ownership or equity position. Would you say that was a, a big difference between New Zealand and the states? Definitely. We, we view the whole industry as our employer and as a ladder. And if you want to move up, you can move up. You've just got to be prepared to ask questions and, and learn. And in, in, that, in that period of great expansion in the late 90s, early 2000s, there were certainly people, uh, and I was probably one, uh, who were promoted above their skill level. You've just got to recognise when you're out of your depth and admit it, though plenty of them didn't. It's levelled off now, but it was it was certainly a, a time of certainly people being promoted above their competence just because there was such a shortage of people willing to step into the roles and, and mm -hmm. farms being converted to dairying very, very quickly. 2001, Fonterra was formed. Mm -hmm. All of our processes were cooperatives and all of our milk was sold overseas through the dairy board. Mm-hmm. And then the uh, Europeans said, well, no, that's a single seller. You can't have that. That's anti-competitive. We changed the law to allow the formation of one giant cooperative on Terra with other cooperatives competing for the milk. But we had one big cooperative that could compete on a global scale. Mm -hmm. But that change in law said that Fonterra had to take the milk from anyone who wanted to supply them. So all of a sudden you had a lot of people converting to dairying because Fonterra had to take your milk and still does have to take your milk. So that drove uh, exponential growth in the New Zealand dairy industry in the early 2000s. Fonterra is a cooperative of, 
of dairies, and it's it's a monster. I mean, it's massive, uh, like a, on a global competitive scale. It's one of the big boys, correct? Correct. It's it's interesting that, and my figures might be a little out here, but New Zealand produces maybe four percent of the world's dairy products. Not not very much. We are a drop in the global bucket. But since our country is so small, and we only consume a very small fraction of what we produce, uh, we're responsible for something like 45% of the dairy product traded globally. So as far as global trade goes, yeah, we're one of the big boys. Yeah. All right. It's it's a fascinating concept and honestly one that I don't I, – I can't believe other countries, especially smaller countries, have not adopted because it seems – when we were over there, which was quite a while ago, uh, you you didn't hear people really – the farmers ripping on Fonterra, which that's not the case here in the states where people belong to co-ops and all they do is complain about them. Oh, yeah. Fonterra have had their issues, but, but generally <laughs> generally they do a good job. Uh, with, with the, uh, before Fonterra was uh, formed 18 years ago, the New Zealand dairy farm was getting paid somewhere near half of what a European dairy farm was getting paid for our milk. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're at parity. We, we get paid the same, if not more, than our European counterparts. So Fonterra has been very good for us. Okay. Now you are at a point in your career where you started, you, were, you had zero ag background, but you've recently actually become an equity partner in the dairy that you're working for. Is that correct? That's correct. We, um, part of the problem with moving around from job to job uh, is that the school year does not match up with the, uh, with the farming year. So your far farm job starts on June the 1st, but your kids start school in January. Mm-hmm. So every time you move farm, your kids move school, and they are six months behind, or it takes them, you know, they're, they're starting in the middle of a school year. So my wife and I uh, decided when our kids were younger that we wanted to find a job where we could settle down and our kids would be at the same school for their entire schooling life. And failing that, we wanted to find a town where we could send our kids to school in town, and if we moved jobs, the kids would stay in the same school. So that was our goal. Mm -hmm. We moved to the South Island for that, and we had one job, which uh, didn't didn't work out, and we moved on after a year. And then we found this one, which is just um, seven kilometres out of town, nice and close to town. It's uh, 1,000 cows, 700 acres. And I've been managing this farm. This is my 15th year now managing it, uh, which is very long, a very long stay for anyone. And uh, last year, the farm owners came to me and offered my wife and I a chance to buy into the farm. So uh, that we did. So we're now part owners and, and still manage the farm. And it's uh, a job for life now. We won't be going anywhere. Okay. You've been there for 15 years. Uh, were you expecting this, this opportunity? No, no, not at all. I'd, I'd been looking for jobs sporadically while I was there just because I didn't know what was coming next. I'm 49. I don't know how many more years I've got uh, left in me milking a thousand cows. It does take it out of you. And I had to start thinking about what comes next. What, what's the retirement plan? And now it turns out uh, owning a percentage of this farm is my retirement plan. So what is the goal? I mean, 49, you're still a young guy, even though, I mean, that is a physically demanding job. Are you still going to be part of the day-to-day op -day operation of the farm? Or are you going to move more into, I don't know, for, I guess, a better lack of a term, a, a more of a desk job? A lot of the job already is, is desk, and mm -hmm. it's getting more so with uh, compliance, environmental compliance and traceability. Uh, there's, there's a lot more regulation coming our way. So I have taken myself out of milking a bit, but I still milk the cows, just not as often as I used to. Moving more into planning and strategy while still keeping my hand in. It's a nice position to be in, to be able to do that. You've got to have staff that you trust 
uh, and who are good at their jobs to be able to do that as well. Are you feel like you're sitting pretty good? I think it's a, it's a very exciting time to be a dairy farmer in New Zealand. The the payout is, is high and looks like getting higher. Uh, we've got challenges coming our way, and, and New Zealand dairy farming has always been about meeting and overcoming those challenges. So it's never boring. Okay. You ready for a curveball question? You're never ready for a curveball question. So <laughs> hit me with it. All right, so I, I dropped it in a, a group that I was going to be interviewing you, and I started getting questions. And one of the one of the things, as someone that reads your, your blog, uh, sounds like religiously, and uh, oh, s- said there was a blog where you talked about uh, some things that happened in your life that made you more tolerant. Now, what was that about? Um, yeah, that would have been my most popular blog post and, and that was quite personal there was a um i assume this is the one about the the terror attack in christchurch which was absolutely awful and christchurch is only an hour north of, of where i live it turns out that one of the a mosque that this uh, terrorist had uh, planned to target was also not very far away from where i live even even closer mm-hmm. um one of the things that twitter has done Twitter has given me access to views and opinions that I never would see in my day-to-day life, mm-hmm. uh, whether that be race, whether that be religion, whether that be sexuality and politics, uh, uh, points of view that I would never have come across before. And, and it certainly made me stop and think that maybe I'm not always right and, and maybe there are other points of view that, that need to be considered and, and other people's feelings that need to be considered. And people should stop and consider these things and, and realize that there is certainly more than one way to view the world. And other ways of viewing the world are, are just as legitimate as, as your own. So I um, I made a terrible mistake on, on Twitter, uh, which I'm sure plenty of white men have made before, is, is I dropped in the N-word um, in, in response to a... Uh, uh, in response to a comedian's tweet about rats, mm-hmm. and I thought it was harmless. And an African American lady, uh, quite kindly, uh, I mean, with barely concealed rage, but she did not tear strips off me, explained to me where I'd gone wrong and and exactly what the the cultural uh, implications of using that word were. And it dawned on me that I had been extremely racist, and I, that's not how you think of yourself. And it, it, um, it gave me a period of, of reflection, and, and I learned from it. That's all you can ask, I guess, is, is that we make these mistakes, and, uh, and we learn from them, and hopefully people forgive you and, and accept that you've learned and move on. That's what life's all about, isn't it, is, is knowing we don't know everything keeping on learning and, and keeping on improving yourself. Recently, uh, while in the state of Iowa, there was a guy that just kind of off the cuff made a uh, a tweet towards uh, Bush Beer, and they started raising a bunch of money, like uh, $3 million bucks for a children's hospital. And then a reporter went back and found tweets from when he was 16. And which, I, you know, I don't even know what the tweet says, but I think it was the N-word too. I'm not sure. The guy even later in his Twitter life actually said that he, you know, they said racist things and, you know, you you learn with experience in life and meeting people, whether it's in real life or through social media and that. But it, it to me, it was unfortunate that there was this lack of unforgiveness to that. I don't care who you are. Until you have life experiences, you're you're ignorant on stuff. You just are. You don't know any better. And I think that's probably maybe oh. what you were trying to get through on this, uh, the blog post. Am I correct? Yes. You need to accept that people can change, but you also need to be willing to change yourself. Like that, that lady who took me to task, she could have, or, or educated me, she could have just as easily torn me a new one, in which case I probably would have ignored her and dug my heels up. Mm-hmm. But I had plenty of people who were willing to take the time. And it's not their job. It's not the people's job to take this time to explain to some ignorant white man why he's wrong. But they did, and they did so kindly, and I, and I learned, and I'm ever grateful for them for doing that. 
some of the stuff that got brought up in uh, that group because they're big fans of yours. I, I didn't. I purposely didn't look up because I wanted to. I wanted to learn as we go. So, could you tell me uh, what the hell is a spare dog? Uh, since 2017, my neighbor's Labrador bitch has been visiting. I have two yellow Labrador dogs. They're the best dog They're in the, the world, dog, by the way. Been... The absolute best. And anybody who says <laughs> they aren't, I'm going to have words with. <laughs> they are the best dogs in the world. And this black lab has been turning up religiously on the farm over and over again. And I started the thread as, as a joke saying, I seem to have a spare dog. <laughs> And then a year, maybe a year into this thread, it wasn't a joke. It was not funny anymore. Um, my dogs <laughs> stay on the farm. They don't, they don't wander. This thing comes around, gets pregnant. Uh -oh. As a litter, this woman sells, sells the puppies. That, oh, I finally, two years down the track, I've, I've, I've had my dogs fixed because I am so tired of this spare dog continually <laughs> turning up. It was, it was it, it, it turned up the day before I, I left for Texas. It was there again. Uh, I don't even tweet about it anymore. People ask me about it, but I'm so over spear dog. <laughs> was your dogs the, the daddy? Well, one of them, uh, or both of them, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, I think they've, they've had, he's had maybe three litters out of my dogs now. Oh, my gosh. Uh, okay. All right. And also, I, I don't know what this means. The whole controversy between the the pasty versus meat pie, is it pasty? Am I saying it right? <laughs> yeah, that, 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 well, that's Rachel Spangler, um, is a is a pasty fan. She's a uh, or a pasty pasty pasty. I don't know fan, and and I've I've learned lots I've learned lots about pasties. Is that you're supposed to throw the crust away? They're a Montana thing. Coal miners lunch. But of course, they're an English thing as well, and and to me, they're they mystery meat surrounded by inedible pastry, and and they're not much fun. But the meat pie, uh, the, you know, the meat pie is a Kiwi classic, and that's mystery meat surrounded by soft, golden, delicious pastry. And uh, I think a, a pie in New Zealand is is very different from pie in America. Yeah, a pie so, in America generally is delicious. Yeah, but you're talking pecan pie or you're talking pumpkin pie. We're, we're talking a delicious meat fully encased in a, in a puffy golden pastry. And it's a, it's an after drinking staple. If you're, if you've been out drinking, you'll go to the service station and get a pie or you'll, um, there's, there's always warmers filled with pies at, at the service station or the supermarket. So uh, the pie is, is part of the Kiwi and Australian way of life. Okay. Well, and for the record, Montana is technically not part of the United States, so don't don't judge us on that. It's interesting. Where, wherever I and I haven't been very many places in the state. Previously, I've been to Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. I stayed in Koreatown in LA, and no matter where I go, I get told you're not in the real USA. <laughs> I'm in Vegas. I'm not. That's not the real United States. If I'm in California, that's not the real United States. And I'm, I'm sure there'd be people. Oh, I think Texas might be. I think I might, might have finally hit the real USA in Texas. But I was going to say, if you heard that in them. Texas, it's someone that's visiting Texas. <laughs> 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 okay, I've been to both. I've been down to where you, you're in Austin. Is that where you said? I'm in Austin. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been to Austin. I've been to New Zealand. Uh, that, I would say, is two different cultures. Very, very different. I thought New Zealand reminded me of like the United States that I grew up in. Uh, it was every bar you stopped into, people talked to you. I mean, everybody's very nice. There was still the notion that hard work would get you ahead. And we were over there because New Zealand had dropped all their farm subsidies. Everyone we talked to loved that because then it was just, you know, mano a mano. You know, I can either make it or break it on, you know, how my farm is doing. Now, one, a few of the people that we visited there had some concerns because they said, already I feel like they're getting some regulations in and they were talking about, well, we'll subsidize these and that. So what is the state of New Zealand ag? Are you guys subsidized or non-subsidized? 
there are zero subsidies. Uh, they were removed in the in the eighties. There is nothing. It is purely free market. And what's your thought on that? Absolutely perfect. I, I uh, can't understand any any country working any other way. It, we are not subsidised, and we manage to put a pound of butter on on the shelf in Europe cheaper and more efficiently than the Europeans can. Mm. It's um, it's how the market should work, and it, it's led to the great rise in dairy farming because people naturally want to put their land into the uh, use which gives them the highest possible return and and for nearly two decades now that has been dairy farming so that is what people have done the one of the shareholders of of the farm who was the original farm owner his family farm he's adamant because the uh, farm was converted in 2000 from uh, small seed crops and cropping and finishing lambs, he's adamant that it's only in de- it's only a dairy farm now because that is what is the highest return, and that we have to be prepared to shift the farm use to something else should that make more economic sense. Okay, I'll ask you your opinion on this because there's no way to really gauge it. But when we went over there, uh, we were being told that uh, when New Zealand cut their subsidies, it was a bloodbath. There was all these bankruptcies. There was farmers committing suicides. And then we got over there and we definitely got mixed reactions uh, from some of the groups. They said yes from a lot of the farmers. They were like, well, obviously there were were some. Uh, We think those got kind of blown out of proportion. Uh, All in all, we didn't think it was that bad. But those are the guys that survived. Uh, So I, I guess I'll ask your opinion on how that went when they I, dropped the subsidies? I, I think it was the right move. It was definitely the right move, but I, I, it was implemented poorly. So people were going bankrupt because oh, all of a sudden they had a great tax liability, but no income to pay it. So mm-hmm. rather than being phased in over time, it was we just ripped that plaster off, mm-hmm. and it, was, it just happened. So it was 100% the right thing to do, but it was also 100% not done as well as it could have been done uh, with very little sympathy or thought of the consequence. So, yes, people did go broke. and um, But the same the world over, uh, agricultural suicide rates are, are shocking no matter what country you're in and, and still are in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. So if you were king of the world and could wave a magic wand, and it sounds like you are pro- unsubsidized ag how would you implement that in the states the states the states is a vast and complex that i can't even get my head around your dairy <laughs> industry let alone how your sub, how your subsidies work it is all a mystery to me that's what i don't understand is, is even why there would be subsidies in the, the states to me has always been about the free market mm-hmm. and capitalism and, and you find an equilibrium, and, and if nobody wants to buy your corn, then you plant something else. But we, we don't plant crops generally without a contract, so so we know that there's a buyer for it. And then, you know, if, if the contract isn't high enough, we plant something else or do something else. So I, I just don't even understand your subsidy system and, and why you would pour billions into it. it. It's an absolute mystery why you don't let the market... Uh, dictate what's going to happen. Believe me, I've heard the arguments for both sides, and both of them have relevance. Uh, both of them have good points, uh, but it's unfortunately we're in a country that uh, geopolitically is not going to not be involved in a lot of things. Uh, so I feel like agriculture in the U.S. will continue to be a pawn because that's what we do. We can grow good crops, and that's what we export that the rest of the world needs, but that's just my opinion. All right, let's go back to New Zealand because if you would ask me, hey, if you had to pull up stakes and move to anywhere else in the world, where would it be? I've always said, since I've been there, 2005, I've always said New Zealand because of the people that I met over there, the attitudes that the, the agriculture had over there, Uh, the work ethics that people had over there, uh, and the scenery. I mean, it is mind-blowing how beautiful it is over there. I mean, just go watch Lord of the Rings. It's gorgeous over there. 
So where you live or where you work, what does it look like? Describe your surroundings. So I, I live on the, the Canterbury Plains, so so much like much like Texas, it, it's flat. But from where I live, I can get in my car and one hour I can be on the ski field. And the South Island is split in half lengthwise by the, a mountain range called the Southern Alps. So I'm a, a, an hour from there and then I'm maybe 15 minutes less from a, a beach that I could fish at. But um, maybe maybe an hour from a beach that I'd swim at um, should should be that be what I want to do. Uh, green grass all year round. We irrigate in, in Canterbury. Water uh, water is the one thing New Zealand has got in, in abundance. You would not believe how much water we have, and and that's why when we farm, we farm outside. We're a temperate climate. Things tend to grow all year round, and there's there's plenty of water. Um, my rainfall though is probably only 24 inches a, a year. There's that much water under my feet that I can irrigate all summer and, and keep the grass growing. Yeah, the climate is just made to grow stuff. Like the, the pines, they were growing pines for lumber, and they were growing pines in 15 years, where in the States they were around 50 or so. I don't know. Someone could correct me on that. But, yeah, it, the whole country is amazing because it's like you took everything from the United States and you shrunk it. I mean, you've got mountains, That's you've right. got plains, you've got hills, you've got beaches, you've got you've got everything, and it's just so much more condensed. But yet, it seems like when we were there anyway, that it's still a lot of room. It's like uh, rural America where not everybody's on top of each other. Well, there's, there's only four million people. I, I live in the South Island, and the South Island is the largest land mass of the, of the two islands, of the two main islands. And there's only one million people in the South Island. And then when you get to the North Island, there's three million, but two million of those live in the top half. Mm -hmm. So if you start in Auckland, and yeah, sure, start in Auckland, but don't stay there. <laughs> and either move north, which is beautiful, but as, as you move south, just the, the population density decreases. Mm -hmm. And once you cross the, get on the ferry and cross the Cook Strait and come to the South Island, uh, it just gets less and less people which suits me fine i love it yeah i went to a beach there and they said if you stood in this one spot you were the first person to see the sunrise of that day and i think that was in the south island you know what i'm talking about yeah i might have been in north island i think you might have been in gisborne gisborne ah could be i don't know i drank a lot in that trip you would have blended right on yes i did <laughs> Yeah, the best part is walking in and a rugby game's going on and you say, hey, what's the hockey score? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't brave enough on Saturday at the University of Texas game to tell them that rugby was better. How can you take, how, how can you take four hours to play a game with, what is it, 80 minutes of playtime, 60 minutes of playtime? Sounding that you could sit in a stadium four hours well, he's, watch, yeah, I've played legs. both. I've played football. I've played rugby. You can play football longer because you have pads. And you keep hitting each other without pads. You aren't going to play as long. Just simple as that. But they're not playing. They're standing around talking to each other. Well, you got to so figure out the plays, man. Come the, on. There's probably the same amount of action. There's probably eight, there's 80 minutes of playtime in rugby, and the game's over in 90 minutes. Is, is there 80 minutes of playtime in football? I don't it even, yeah, hours. it depends on what level. I don't even know what the pros play. But, yeah, at least we throw the <laughs> football forward. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Craig Hickman, first of all, tell everybody where they can find you on social media. Are you sure they want to know? I, um, I don't know. Dairy it's Man up to them. <laughs> you can find me at DairymanNZ, and then uh, in my profile is a link to the a link to the blog you were talking about. I'm going to look forward to that, too, because uh, it's funny. I just mentioned that I was going to be interviewing you, and then everybody knew who you were, and they knew about your blog. And, yes, you got some weird friends. That Varen, I, he's not right in the head. No, no, I don't know how I ended up following that guy. Yeah, I don't either. Uh, every day I think I should block him, but I never seem to. But anyway. <laughs> you're, you're a busy guy. Yeah. Craig Heckman from New Zealand, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. And everybody else, we hope you tune in next week. 
And thank you for listening to the Shark Farmer Podcast. I am your host, Rob Sharkey. Please visit us at www.sharkeyfarms.com. And just search for Shark Farmer to follow me on Twitter. Later.